Welcome to The Wrap. WRAL's Capital Team presents a podcast each week where we talk about all the happenings at the North Carolina legislature and beyond, as we'll talk about this week. I'm Brian Murphy. I'm joined by Will Doran, WRAL's state government reporter. Welcome, Will. We're going to have a, a lot to get through. It was a busy week in North Carolina politics. Let's start with uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's been in the news for a couple of weeks now. Nothing happening at the legislature, but lots of action on DEI uh, at the university level. And the Board of Governors voted this week to go ahead and institute its policy that repeals its 2019 policy that stated that everybody had to have a diversity and uh, equity, a diversity and inclusion officer on their campus. Uh, the new policy strips all that away, rewrites the entire thing, a, a repeal and replace, if you will, um, and really focuses on equality, um, not equity, but equality, saying everyone should be judged on their own merit. Um, and a lot of fallout from this, obviously, all across the state, all across different campuses. I was in the room when they voted. Uh, kind of surprising. Some members, uh, you know, seem to be arguing in favor of DEI, only to at the end say they're against, uh, you know, the old policy and, and in favor of the new policy. Just two board members, both African American, voted against the policy changes. There's 23 members on the board right now. Um, Will, what, what's been your takeaway from watching this from a little bit from afar? And you've written a, a lot on DEI as well. Yes. Um, I mean, this has been a long time coming. Um, and, you know, this is not happening in a vacuum. This is part of kind of a broader, not just statewide, but national pushback against uh, kind of some of the racial justice reforms and efforts that we saw in the wake of the 2020 George Floyd and Black Lives Matter protests. And we've seen it in the, in here in North Carolina in the form of this vote to repeal the DEI policies. There have been other uh, efforts last year, the state legislature passed a new law banning uh, state agencies and universities from uh, making new employees basically affirm their support for the concept of diversity um, or just any kind of social question or issue like that. Um, you know, there's been we, – we passed a lot of kind of criminal justice reforms in the wake of those 2020 protests. There's been a kind of a steady rollback of a lot of those over the last couple of years. So this is just kind of the, the next – Stage in here, and I should note, you know, like you said, this DEI policy that the UNC system has passed in 2019. It was a lot of the exact same people who are on this board, who were voting to approve it five years ago, are now voting to get rid of it. All of these people are appointed by the leaders of the state legislature, and I asked Senate Leader Phil Berger about that this week. You know, said, "Hey, (laughs) these are all your folks. You were fine with them when they put this in place in 2019. You know, now." Presumably, there's some pressure on them to get rid of it. What changed? And he said, well, it was the kind of thing that seemed fine at the time, but there's a difference between, you know, what it looks like on paper versus how it's been implemented. And that's kind of the message I think that we've been hearing, right? I mean, I I think probably some BOG members said that at the meeting, too, that it's gone too far. It's led to too much politicization on campuses and trying to push certain views on students and faculty. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, this comes uh, not only in the heels of all the stuff you mentioned, but on the heels of UNC losing a case about affirmative action at the U.S. Supreme Court um, that said they you know, couldn't uh, base admissions decisions on, on race, although we'll see how that plays out in the years to come. What, what I found interesting is that Peter Hans, the system president, you know, talked about it's not the place of the administrative staff of the university. Um, and, and he's talking about the broad administrative staff, not, not necessarily staff members on campus, but the system and, and administrators on campus to get involved in social and political debates. And, I, and it's hard to disagree with that, right? They, but where it went a step that I, that I was quite frankly a little stunned is to think that gender and race are social and political debates. Because that seemed to be the next logical conclusion is that we, as administrators, can't get involved in these debates. We want the free flow of an exchange of ideas, and we're not going to get involved in in hot-button social and political debates. I take that as, like, we're not going to take a position on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or we're not going to take a position on – you know who to vote for for president or the the Ukraine Russia war what i did what i don't take that as is we're not going to take a position on whether you know we should have 10% of our student body be african american or 18% of our body of our student body be latino um but that you know they seem to indicate that the board and they all voted in favor of this most of them that that kind of institutional neutrality 
it extends even to issues like that, like race and gender on campus. And I just thought I thought that was a kind of a fascinating way of looking at it to hear many of them talk. The kind of diversity they care the most about is diversity of thought. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you've seen that, too. I mean, the state legislature recently spent four million dollars uh, for UNC Chapel Hill to create an entirely new school on campus that's essentially dedicated to bringing in conservative professors to teach conservative classes and ideals because they think that, you know, it's too lefty in Chapel Hill. Yeah. And, and so it's interesting. There is some diversity they do want to see on campus and are willing to spend money to make sure that kind of diversity is on campus. And that's diversity of thought, uh, more conservative speakers, more conservative professors. Um, but at the same time, they're they're saying you can't spend money on other diversity programs that may uh, that may help, uh, you know, African-American students or Latino students or, quite frankly, rural students or first generation students. Um, I, I was amazed looking at some of the programs, you know. The School of Medicine at UNC has a rural initiatives program. This is, you know, one of two medical schools in the state. Uh, the state is largely rural. You know, if you get outside of Wake County and Mecklenburg County, it's a, it is still a rural state. And we have a huge shortage of doctors in those rural areas. And so, you know, even that kind of fell under DEI. We'll see. Now the schools have until September 1st to implement this policy and we'll, and we'll see where they go. Interesting that UNC has sort of been at the focal point of all of this. And the board, Peter Hans, came out and said their action to remove $2.3 million from DEI spending was was premature and, and overstepped uh, Board of Governors policy because they, they directed that money to, to public safety. The, the, and you wrote about this uh, last week, but the policy talks about well-being. That money needs to be re- directed to student well-being. I could see both UNC uh, Chapel Hill's argument that, hey, public safety is well-being, but also what the board seems to indicate is that money needs to go to more student-centric programs. Yes, the the specific language that this policy uses is basically just the the higher ed jargon for you need to use this on academic and mental health counseling. Um, you know, so whether it's at the you know the the student center or at the you know campus health center, like it, it the money needs to get focused there, not on you know, putting up new cameras around campus or buying the police, you know, fancy new clothes or night vision goggles or whatever, uh, you know, the the board of trustees may want to do. Now, of course, I mean, this board is, you know, all politicians and lawyers. Uh, they, I'm sure they can easily make the argument that, you know, putting more money towards law enforcement is helping student success and well-being. And that could be a fight that we head towards in the future. I should note too, though, I mean, the board of trustees doesn't have the ultimate say on a school's budget. That is up to the chancellor. Now, of course, the chancellor can be fired by the board of trustees <laughs> if they don't like his budget. Um, so, you know, there's some checks and balances there. But, uh, you know, this is certainly not set in stone, even though, yes, it, it did make big headlines when the board of trustees did take that vote saying we need to slash 100 percent of DEI funding, send it all to the police. That's not necessarily going to happen. And there seems to be, like you said, some uh, some pushback even from people within the system. You're talking about a campus that had a, a fatal shooting on campus this school year. You could easily make a case that well-being includes you know, bulking up uh, safety. But we're going to let them fight about it. We're, we're certainly <laughs> not going to fight about that. We're going to move on. DEI will be in the news. I'm sure we'll be talking about it here on The Wrap quite frank, uh, quite, for, for quite a long time. Uh, When we return from this short break, we'll talk about a couple of big uh, North Carolina Supreme Court decisions, as well as budget talks going south um, and and a Cooper veto of an interesting bill. All that when we come back on The Wrap. All right, we're back on The Wrap. Uh, He's Will Doran. I'm Brian Murphy. Uh, Let's go. Let's start with these Supreme Court cases. The one's been around for a long time. This case involves a 2016 elections challenge. Uh, Explain it to us. Yeah, so uh, this was one of the first (laughs) cases that I ever covered as a political reporter (laughs) eight years ago. It finally just got a ruling from the state Supreme Court, if anyone ever had a question about how slowly the wheels of justice can turn. Um, But yeah, so after the 2016 elections, when Governor now Governor Roy Cooper defeated Pat McCrory by just a few thousand votes. McCrory, you know, was fighting for a recount. And as part of that, basically, he had a lot of supporters, uh, lawyers for his campaign, just throw out accusations against people of committing voter fraud. It was dozens and dozens of people and all of them were false. It was basically just really sloppy work. You know, they were like, oh, well, you know, two 
Will Dorans voted, but they didn't realize it was like a senior and a junior. Um, they were just accusing someone of voting twice. And so they have since admitted that, yes, all of their accusations were false. And so a lot of these voters then sued for defamation. And what the campaign attorney said is, look, this process, when you're when it's right after an election, it's really short time frames. There's a lot of pressure, you know, a lot of moving parts. You have to have the freedom to to be able to make some accusations, even if they later turn out to be wrong, because if you scare people away from using the process, then that could create a situation where actual voter fraud doesn't get challenged because people are too afraid of being sued because, you know, you only have a few days to make these challenges and, you know, you can't necessarily do a really in-depth investigation in just a handful of days. And so that is kind of the crux of this argument. And it's been going on for eight years. Um, And then this week, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the McCrory team. Um, You know, probably no surprise there. The Supreme Court is majority Republican. Uh, You know, McCrory is a Republican. All the lawyers were Republican lawyers in this case. Um, But I think it has big implications for 2024 because, you know, while this deals with the governor's race, I mean, we have seen obviously – Nationally, you know, President Donald Trump has made all sorts of allegations about voter fraud. Um, You know, if we have another close race here in North Carolina, whether it's for president or governor, anything else, maybe that congressional race out in the northeastern part of the state between Don Davis and Lori Buckout, you know, if that comes down to a couple hundred votes, a couple thousand votes, you know, this really opens the door for either side, not just Republicans. Democrats could do it too now, presuming, you know, that this court case holds that you could just kind of throw out any sort of allegations you wanted people and really kind of abuse this process uh, is, is what critics are saying. Now, supporters are saying, how are you, how are you going to <laughs> sue people for, for trying to, uh, you know, be a watchdog over the system? Yeah, I thought the, the court's ruling was really interesting. It basically said, hey, in this power, you're – You have absolute immunity, sort of absolute to do whatever you need to do, because if you don't do this, then then election. It basically placed the election integrity over, you know, your rights not to be accused of doing something wrong, which I thought was was really fascinating. One of the things they said was no real harm. There's no real harm against the two Will Dorans that we accused. It's not like they lost their right to vote. It's not like you know anything came of this. And so, what what is the true harm? The true harm is if we don't discover uh, you know voter fraud or election you know integrity problems. I, I thought it was a pretty fascinating because you don't have really absolute uh, freedoms in it, and you know you don't have an absolute freedom of speech. You don't have an absolute freedom of assembly, as we've seen with these protesters on campuses. There are limitations to all of these things, and and at least my reading of the the decision. Granted, I'm not a lawyer. Um, was that in this at least in this very specific case of election challenges, you do sort of have absolute freedom to make these kind of of accusations. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a quasi judicial uh, proceeding, and so they said you you know you do need the power to to make these kind of accusations. You know, even if it does lead to people, you know get in the stink eye when they go to their local <laughs> diner and try to order dinner after they've been accused of committing voter fraud. Uh, let, well, let's move on. The, the budget, uh, the short session is supposed to be about making some tweaks to the budget. Obviously, we have a, a big budget surplus. Uh, it sounds as if the House wants to spend that and a little bit more money, a, a little bit, maybe a billion dollars more. Uh, Senator Berger, uh, th- who's always, who's the Senate's always been, at least in, in my experience recently, has been more fiscally conservative That's correct, than the sure. House. Uh, a little tighter with the purse strings and, and no different this year. The House wants to spend a little bit more. Berger says, hey, there's, there's too much pork in, in what the House wants to do. Yeah, we were talking to him, and I mean, he was more explicit, really, than I've ever heard him be um, on just the budget seems in trouble. <laughs> there, are, he he noted, look, we we already passed a tentative budget for this year, and you know, even though we've got this billion dollar budget surplus, maybe we just don't won't spend a single penny of it because the house wants to spend too much on pork, and he thinks that's just the wrong way to go. So it seems that he's really digging in his heels. Let's be honest. They're going to spend some of it. I mean, there's broad agreement across both chambers about, uh, you know, uh, filling up the opportunity scholarships fund so that everybody on the wait list, there, there are some other areas where they agree that 
some spending uh, needs to needs to take place. I'd be I'd be very surprised if you know this is some political posturing and game playing here. I'd be very surprised if the Senate decides, okay, forget it. We'll stick with the budget that we have. We'll put the surplus in the rainy day fund, and we won't true up opportunity scholarships. We won't put any money for childcare. We won't do anything about state workers. I, I find it really hard to believe that the Senate is just going to let it all go. I mean, we'll see. Uh, you know, the the prospect of state workers getting any further raise than that has already been approved in this budget, which I think is about two or three percent raise, is pretty low. Right. They they may get some bonuses, but they're not going to get a permanent raise, uh, almost certainly. Um, yeah, the the child care funding is a, another question. Of course, the vouchers is the big thing. The Senate has actually they've passed an individual bill that would fund vouchers with almost half a billion dollars, and so that's at the House now. That could pass even if they do run into a budget stalemate. Of course, the House may choose to hold that hostage in order to get some of the pork projects they want. Well, that's what I was going to ask. How much of this debate, this debate over the budget, is informed by what happened on on masks? And that was the big issue earlier in the week. It's hard to believe that this week contains so many big stories. But, you know, the mask bill, which the Senate pushed through over objections, kind of met a fiery end in the House. It's not over yet, but to have Republicans coming out, Aaron Paré, John Torbett, others coming out and saying, no, we don't like what the Senate did with these masks. Let's bring back the health and safety uh, exemption. Really seem like, uh, you know, sometimes the House and Senate disagree, but this seemed like a very public disagreement. Yeah, I mean, you know, normally when they're talking about these budget deals, they are very reticent to directly criticize the other side. And so I wonder a little bit if, uh, you know, Senator Berger being a little bit more uh, ornery against House leadership has to deal with this really public spat over the mask bill and uh, House Republicans basically making all of the exact same arguments that the Senate Democrats were making against the Senate Republicans on this mask bill. Um, You know, there will be something. They're, they're going to come together and figure out some sort of fix here because it, the bill was not just to ban people from wearing masks in public for health reasons. Uh, that section was really done to make it easier for police to crack down on protesters. And other parts of the bill would do things like raise criminal penalties for people who commit crimes while wearing a mask, which could include protesters blocking a highway, which this bill would also increase the penalties for additionally. Um, you know, protesters littering, uh, you know, that that's a common charge or trespassing. Um, you know, so if you're wearing a mask uh, while you're protesting and get charged with crime, you know, you could see increased penalties. Of course, if you're robbing a bank while you're wearing a mask, you get charged with higher penalties, too. Um, but there seems to be broad support, uh, not just among Republicans, but among some Democrats for a lot of those provisions. It was really just the part about the masks. And you know, even if you say, OK, well, I think the Democrats are kind of exaggerating this. I mean, it blew up. It was national news and people did have legitimate worries. And some of the House Republicans, especially the ones like Aaron Paré, who are in more competitive seats, are sitting there saying, what are you guys doing <laughs> throwing all of this political ammunition to the Democrats right now? Like, even if we don't think the Democrats are technically right about the the law and how it would be applied by a judge, like still kind of raises a whole lot of questions that are going to give people legitimate fears in an election year when we're trying to maintain our supermajorities in the case of a you know potential future Governor Josh Stein. Uh, so I, I don't expect that that mask provision so, is going to survive. So much of this needs to be looked at through that political lens. Aaron Paré is worried about November. Uh, the Senate the, the way the Senate map is, they're not as worried about November as there are some frontline House members. And, and look, it took Trisha Cotham switching parties to give the Republicans a supermajority in the House. That That's very tenuous. Uh, you know, they yeah. lose two seats and all of a sudden they don't have a supermajority anymore. So I think House members are worried about their their part time jobs um, more than more than maybe members of the Senate are. And, and I th- as you said, this gives Senate, you know, gives uh, Democrats, particularly in those House races, some ammunition. Yeah. Well, and one other thing that we saw this week uh, kind of through that same lens of legislation that's moving with a very political lens is this constitutional amendment uh, that says only citizens can vote. I thought that was already in the Constitution. It is already in the Constitution. <laughs> this would just basically kind of reword the the rules that are already there. And so critics are saying that, you know, this is just basically a political ploy to trick people into thinking that immigrants are voting and they're going to keep voting unless you go to the polls and stop them. And, you know, obviously that would be helpful to the Republican Party for boosting turnout among their voters this election. 
you know, critics say, well, there's this, you know, push nationally, even if it hasn't come to North Carolina yet, to let immigrants vote in some like city council and local races. I, I think there's a couple of like northeastern towns that have started doing this. You know, it's it's not any sort of widespread thing, but it is happening. And so they said, you know, we think we need to pass this kind of reaffirm North Carolina support for the concept that only citizens can vote. But, you know, obviously, anytime you put, you know, a, a constitutional amendment on the ballot in a big presidential election like you, you're like this, it you know, it has ulterior motives. Yeah. And we've seen that with Democrats trying to get abortion uh, measures on the ballot in Florida and Arizona and other places. Uh, Congress took up this issue and, and said, D.C., you cannot let uh, non-citizens vote in any of your elections. We know that non-citizens cannot vote in federal elections. Um, and in North Carolina, as you said, they can't vote in any elections, but there have been some smaller places where they could vote in some elections. And you could see the, the rationale for that, like particularly legal, legal immigrants, people who are here you know, in the country for a long time, should maybe should have a say on who their mayor is or what their city council does, but uh, not going to happen here in North Carolina. And we'll see if that gets on the ballot. Um, a couple quick ones. Let's let's try to wrap this up. Uh, Governor Cooper vetoed a bill that his own Department of Transportation wanted over saving some trees. Is <laughs> yes. that is did I get that right? <laughs> yeah. So you know it's rare for a governor's administration to request a bill and then have the governor veto it, but it is because Republicans stuck in a provision that Cooper has opposed for years. It's actually something that he vetoed back in 2019, and so there was a lot of eye rolling when this got added into the bill. Um, you know, this is the bill we've written about it a lot. It would hike toll road late fees by 50 percent. That would raise millions of dollars for the state from forgetful drivers like me. Um, <laughs> Get the you know. easy pass, people. Get the easy pass. <laughs> Cooper has no problems with that part. Um, I mean, that's, you know, his own administration's ask. Um, what he does object to is the uh, the billboard industry wants to be able to cut down more trees, um, pretty, you know, increase the area of trees they can cut down and also remove some protections for trees like red buds that are currently uh, absolutely protected in state law. Now, Republicans point out, one, billboard companies would like to make more money and, you know, so let's let them do that. But two, this would just align what a private billboard owner can do with the rules that DOT has made for itself on how much you know trees it can cut down near DOT's own signs. So that's kind of their line is like, hey, if the government is allowing <laughs> itself to cut down this many trees, why shouldn't private business people be allowed to cut down as many trees too? So Cooper vetoed that. It's going to get overridden. But, you know, environmentalists are pleased with him and tourism, you know, officials are pleased with him for, you know, at least putting up a fight. Seems like a bill my son would be against. <laughs> Do not cut down any more trees. He's, he's a big, uh, big on keeping the trees healthy. Uh, Cooper is in Europe. Uh, as we record this, and we'll be there for a, a little while uh, on a jobs mission. On a jobs mission, but also tweeting about the the hurricanes. <laughs> well, you know, if you're the number one hurricanes fan in the state, and the general manager resigns, you've you've got to to tweet about that. Um, that all, if you want to read about Don Waddell, that we have a whole sports station dedicated to that. Also, lots of stories on um, WRL Sports Fan. Uh, let's end with this. The the GOP convention is taking place over the weekend. We'll have lots of coverage of that, uh, depending on when you're listening to this. What what are you looking forward to? What what are the big highlights of this NC GOP convention here in in um, in the state this weekend? Yeah, you know, uh, North Carolina was the closest state that went for Trump in 2020. Um, you know, so basically where Biden came closest to flipping a red state, and so you know, Republicans from the national level. Have a close eye on North Carolina make sure that it does not keep drifting further to the left because it was much closer in 2020 than it was in 2016. And so we're actually going to see both chairs of the RNC speaking here. Uh, Michael Watley, who is the former North Carolina GOP chair, another sign of how much uh, <laughs> national Republicans have their eyes on North Carolina. And also uh, Laura Trump, who is uh, from North Carolina, went to NC State. Um, so, you know, lots of North Carolina angles there. Um Laura Trump and Eric Trump are going to be speaking Friday night, and then Saturday we're going to hear speeches from Michael Watley, from Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, from the North Dakota governor, Doug Burgum, I guess. Uh, VP trials continue. This is the, the you know, I feel like this is the American Idol VP, uh, <laughs> sir, you know, VP search edition. Christy Nome failed her, failed her v, v, uh, VP trial run, you know. Killing a dog for no apparent reason doesn't play well with the American voters. But uh, Doug Burgum, 
the governor of North Dakota has a lot of money, which is very important. Yes, and, he is a billionaire. Yeah, and I think Trump seems to like him, so he seems to be getting his moment or you know several moments in the spotlight to see if he can be the VP. Yep, uh, so we'll hear speeches from them. We'll hear speeches from Mark Robinson, maybe some of the other Council of State candidates. Uh, not sure yet uh, if those have been scheduled. Um, but yeah, that'll be interesting. And then next weekend, the Democrats are having their own convention. So lots of politics the next couple of weekends uh, for for people who like speeches and rallies and are interested in who gets uh, chosen to be on the national committees and the the electoral electors, college. right? Yeah. yeah. Which uh, suddenly, you know, maybe before 2020, we didn't care so much who the electors were. Now all of a sudden, yeah. uh, it's a big deal to be an elector. Yep. So those are going to get picked over the next couple of weeks, and uh, then we move into full fledged campaign season as the summer kicks off. Let's conclude with this. You mentioned North Carolina being the closest state uh, that voted for Trump. Uh, we've seen a, a slew of polls that indicate kind of those Sun Belt states. What I, what I call the Sun Belt states: Georgia. Arizona, Nevada, which Biden won all three last time, are sort of going toward Trump, and that Biden's pathway uh, to re-election may lie in the the blue wall, the blue Midwestern wall of Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. I'm throwing a lot of states at you here. North Carolina would have the ability to sort of flip that, uh, you know, kind of upside down, uh, it, really taking a key state out of tr- whatever path Trump might have to election. Of course, if he if he sweeps all those states, he's going to be president. If Biden could hold on to those three uh, Midwestern states, in theory, he, he would win if, if everything else stays the same. How, Which is a long setup for this question. How important is North Carolina when you look at those? Uh, I argued last time that those other six states were on one tier and North Carolina might have been the top state, but on the second tier. When we look at the 2024 election, are we still looking at the same dynamic where those six states are, are just in a different c- class and different category? Or has North Carolina, because of some of the leakage in Nevada and Arizona, sort of elevated itself? Yeah, I mean, we could do an entire podcast <laughs> on that question. Um, Let me throw this out 26 <laughs> minutes into the pod. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think that North Carolina is going to continue receiving a ton of attention from both sides. Um, I mean, I don't know when the last time a Republican won the pre- the White House without winning North Carolina was. It might have been like 60 years ago with Nixon. Um, someone double check my math on that. Um, but <laughs> I put yeah, you on the spot on this yeah, one. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, North Carolina is a must win state for Republicans. Um, and, you know, obviously Biden has proved that he can, you know, a Democrat can win the presidency without winning North Carolina. But the other factor is our governor's race. The governor's race here is basically the most important in the country. A lot of states hold their governor's races in off years. Um, Not a whole lot do it in a presidential year like North Carolina does. And we're one of the few with an open race. And we're, I think, maybe the only one and certainly the biggest one uh, that's kind of a swing state. Um, So, you know, with... uh, questions over whether Republicans will be able to hold on to a supermajority in the legislature uh, with questions about who the next governor is going to be, since it's not going to be Roy Cooper. He's term limited. He can't run again. Um, I think that also makes both parties uh, spend more time and money in North Carolina on, on the presidential race, even if it might be a tier lower than some of those other states you mentioned, like a Wisconsin or a Pennsylvania, Michigan, um, just because so many of the other down ballot races here really, really matter. Yeah, oh, that's a great point. You, you're trying to it, it gets back to that, you know, a citizens only voting. You're trying to goose turnout any way you can, because uh, let's face it, the race for governor, the race probably for superintendent of public instruction, the race for president are probably going to be very, very close, uh, or at least they have been historically very, very close. And, uh, you know, if you can change a few percentage points, two percentage points might change that entire election. Yeah. You know, we've got a state Supreme Court seat on the ballot, too. Democrats have been bleeding those seats over the last few elections. Republicans have swept every single statewide judicial race for the last couple elections in a row. So, you know, if Democrats want any shot at taking back a majority in the next decade, it's got to start with, you know, here and defending the, you know, the seat that they've got on the ballot now. So the you could keep going down the ballot, uh, you know, with reasons for for the national party to be spending time and money here. But yeah, uh, expect to see plenty of visits by Joe Biden and Donald Trump, even if it might not be this weekend. 
He's Will Doran. I'm Doran. I'm Brian Murphy. Thank you for joining us on this edition of The Wrap. Have a great Memorial Day weekend, and we'll see you next week. Uh, check out all of our stories at WRAL.com slash NC Capital. Uh, Will's got you covered. He's writing like a madman during this short session. Lots and lots of issues. Obviously, he said it, uh, the political season is upon us. Sign up for our newsletters. Get our news delivered directly to your inbox every morning. Uh, thanks for listening. Have a safe weekend. We'll see you next week.